Hello there and welcome. This is episode one of my tutorial series for Against the Storm. I did a series like this already in the past, but that was for the early access version. Since a lot of things have changed, I am redoing this series and here we go. So the format here will be 30 minute Let's Play episodes where I explain the game while we're going over victory and victory together and the basic planning is that I'm going to proceed through the difficulty levels here we're going to explore the seal map we're going to explore a different biome in each episode as far as possible and I'll be doing my best to guide you through all the development things in this game as good as I can I chose a let's play format because with the roguelite nature of this game it is really impossible for me to create an environment that holds up for each and every situation so yeah here goes the situation as we see here is a brand new account i haven't played anything on this one there's nothing unlocked if we go into the smoldering city there are no upgrades we're completely naked we're just a fledgling viceroy on his way to the uh, seals here so since I assume that you are totally new to the game, here goes what we're doing. Down here we see the amount of years until the next Blightstorm hits town. We have to build settlements, as many as possible, until we reach that seal, so we can reforge it. So when the next Blightstorm hits town, we have more time before we all have to retreat into the smoldering city to wait until the cycle has ravaged the land again and we get to restart. Each time we manage to reforge one of those seals, you see, there's these rings, we get succeedingly deeper and deeper into the lands. That's how the basics go. We get to select where we settle down, as you see there. These little icons beneath the uh, be, uh, on, on the hexagons are your reward tokens. We got these items here as our meta currency, which we can buy upgrades for that make us permanently stronger. And as soon as this thing here is full, the whole map will reset. And if we haven't made it to the uh, seal yet, we will have to retry it once again. Each point that we click here results in a colony that we have to play and to win. And once we have established that successfully, we can go deeper into the lands. So far, the basics. So we're going to aim now for one of these uh, seals. You can either go for this one or for that one. And the question marks here in between are fun events that are sometimes good, sometimes bad. It really depends on the event there. And we have these locations. Ruins are here, as you see here, providers for another meta currency. So we could consider taking this here to get the extra currency here. But you notice already it strays off from the path. So we're going to go down into the Royal Woodlands, the biome that I would recommend wholeheartedly for every beginner. So left click takes us there. And here we now see the people that we can take into the uh, as our starting trek and what kind of items they will carry around with them. When you're new to the game, beavers are really good to begin the game with as they excel at wood production and that is one thing that is darned important in this game. We see here a summary about the bio, just a written account, pretty nice lore. At the conditions screen though, we get the stats. So we see here what kind of stuff drops out of the trees and what kind of natural resources we can find. Of course, if you are currently new to the game, this is all meaning nothing to you, but the gist here is that's the food stuff, that's the materials that we can build with and uh, fuel our hearth with. with. So every biome also has a certain biome effect. Here, the gift of the woodlands is trees give more wood. It's a really good environment to begin the game with. Over here, we see what kind of embarkation bonuses we want to take with us. That's the amount of embarkation points we got. And as you see, if I left click those, these get deducted and we can just embark. Down here, we can select the difficulty level. I would recommend every beginner to start out with Settler. I'm going to start out on Pioneer as I am very, very convinced that we can make it. And it allows me to explain the game a little bit more thoroughly. 
The differ difference between Pioneer and Settler is, as you see here, there's more debuffs. These red things are debuffs from the storm. And more reputation is required to win. Reputation are basically victory points. We need to allocate a certain amount of reputation and then the game is won. That's the basic game loop. So I'm going to go for Pioneer because it's perfectly uh, doable. I already did it for myself on Viceroy, but that was rather painful, wouldn't recommend. So Pioneer is a good point to start at if you are familiar with survival games and you do like a challenge. And Settler, I would totally recommend if this game is a bit intimidating to you and overwhelming because damn, so much information and all, then go with Settler, it's already hard enough if you are completely new to the genre or if this game is just perplexing you. I will do my best to make that end. And, uh, we now go over here to that part and except for pick beavers, there is not much more to say. I could now of course tell you which one of these items are better than the others, but I think these informations are better spent later down the road when we know a little bit more about the things that go on here. So I'll be explaining that on a future episode. So after all that's been dealt with, we can embark. This opens up the game and this starts the map and this is where we will begin building our colony and start hopefully winning the game. So there we go. We have on this part here, the positive effects of our biome. Every biome has a positive effect or two in the early in the lower difficulty levels. And over here we have the negative effects of the storm season. In this game the year is divided in only three seasons. We have the drizzle season, we have the clearance season, and we have the storm season. The storm season is the recurring challenge season, and it's basically the time of the year where people will go nuts and die, and uh, all manner of bad things can happen if you don't play accordingly. So, we have here an effect that allows our woodcutters to carry more wood in drizzle season, so that means in the first third of the year our woodcutters are more efficient. And this other one here, means that if our people have access to complex food, they are, or they are moving faster. So basic things that we can provide, that we can do, but it's only applying in the first third of the year. Over here, Looming Darkness is the only debuff that the storm always will have. It basically says the more hostile the forest is, the harder it'll be to convince your people to not run away screaming and die in the forest. Short version. Longer version with all the game terms comes later. Over here we see now other effects that the storm will inflict on us. The number here tells you the necessary hosti uh, hostility level of the forest for these to come online. Basically that means this here will only get active if the hostility level is one or higher and this will only be effective at two or higher. We're going to be talking about these, not right now, later when we have the basics down of the game. Currently, I would be only bothering you with details that don't make too much sense. So with Q and E can rotate the map. I totally need my map always aligned to my main warehouse. I'm just weird like that, but here it goes. So we're going to take these away. I would recommend you reading them because the in-game tutorial ain't that horrible. And now, we have here the hearth. This game is a rain punk game. That means we are living in a world that is suffering from constant rainfall. As soon as the fire in the hearth goes down, the moral of the people goes down super fast and everybody will leave the colony. This is basically the heart of your colony. You want this place to be where all hearths in your city, as we can build more of these later, need to be um, provided with fuel at all times. This is one of your primary objectives in the game. Over here we have the central warehouse. This is where the people will drop off the stuff that they gather. When we zoom out we see here in the foggy regions that these are glades that we can discover. There's resources there and uh, many other things. You see this uh, icon here depicting a dangerous glade. These are, as you see, much larger than the others. They always have sort of a challenge going on on them, which requires us to invest workers and resources. And if we don't fulfill these challenges, bad things will happen. 
So there's a risk and reward system linked to these. Also, if we go much, much further out there, we will eventually see these beauties here. These are forbidden glades. These are just like dangerous glades, but on steroids. In a nutshell. All right, so what's important to know is whenever we open a glade, the forest grows more hostile. The forest hostility is being counted in points. Every hundred points, the hostility goes up by, by one level. So we're basically leveling up the hostility by doing things like discovering glades, daring to live here for another year, have people living here in the forest. The, the forest is a um, very hostile entity in this game, in case you haven't noticed already. So in short terms, we have to be very careful with our expansion, as there's always a punishment for expansion in one way or another. Small glades do cost a little bit less hostility though. So as you see here, small glades only cost eight hostility, whereas dangerous glades cost double. But if you compare the size, you will quickly notice that one dangerous glade is more like quadruple the size of a small glade. So you get much more territory to build on for your hostility there. Okay, and if about these things, we have here the people that live here. This is the amount of population. This is the amount of people available. And this is the amount of people having no shelter above their head. So we're now going to get started with a couple of basics that every colony will have, go will have to get going in each and every game. First things first, I get on over here and I tell these guys to prefer wood over any other fuel. Other fuels are always harder to procure and they have side uses rather than wood, which is uh, around here in huge amounts. Up here we have a couple of icons. This is our food, this is our building material, and this is our fuel. As you can see, we're starting out with wood and coal and oil. So we're going to make sure that we're going to use wood first and foremostly. Down here we have our building menu. The very first thing that we require is found in the camps menu, and that is a woodcutter's camp. Woodcutter's camp, I don't think I need to explain much what it does, is a mobile building. That means we build it up here, but you see the wheels attached to it. It can drive around and therefore can be safely repositioned. I'm going to put up my woodcutter camps in this area here, plural. I'm pressing the space bar now to get the game going for the first time. Two woodcutter camps are for me a really standard and feasible start. We're also going to put a path in front of the uh, warehouse here. Paths are to be found here. Paths don't cost anything except for workforce and they make villagers faster. So they are really just a... Uh, Effort, just a little bit of effort where we can't get ourselves a good reward for that. Good. So we see now that the woodcutter camps are open for business. Left clicking it, we see here the worker slots and a lot of little configuration things. So first things first, I click here into the beaver icon and I assign the woodcutter camps completely with these guys. So what we already see here is the hostility bar went up because every woodcutter adds in hostility. The trees don't like to get cut, I guess. Now, configurations here are very, very important, as if we don't do anything, they'll just blindly chop around and open glades, and you like never want that. So we're going to go for avoid glades, except marked, because I find that the uh, best everyday um, setting here, there's nothing wrong with that. Other uh, setups can apply too, if you're a control man, like I am. The secondary options here are also good, but we'll stick with that one. I hold down left shift now and click there and see what it does. We select the second one and the, the command got applied to all of them. If you hold down left shift and uh, chain and click there, all of the workshops in the game get the same command. Pretty useful for larger colony management. Now. The next thing we do now is though we tell them what we want to get cut because I don't want this uh, to be entirely random. So we go here for the axe. So if you hold down left shift, you can make the circle much smaller. And if you hold down control, 
you make it impossible to accidentally mark trees that connect to a glade. This way you can easily, by holding down left control, assign the area like that. I'm a little bit shocked that this is supposedly still not opening the glade. So you can go for this, hold down left shift, this is the uh, exclusion, and now I can tell them to please not chop this tree because this is making me a little bit uh, angsty. But as a matter of fact, if you hold down left control, it's all good. Now, we got now this down so our wood production is safe. The next thing I want to resolve is the homelessness issue. People without a home are unhappy per se. Even many uh, storm effects hit you hard if you have no housing, like this one. Makes you slower in the storm season if you don't have housing. So let's change that. Shelters only require a bit of wood and they house three residents. So we're currently needing three houses to get the entire city set up like that. There we go. As far as I know, people never go to their houses. I've never seen them going to their houses. So let me know if I'm wrong about that. What people do is they uh, take a break at the hearth to eat something, but I legit never seen them going to their houses. Correct me if I stand wrong there. This is one thing that I kept wondering about since ever. <laughs> Now, we see that the people are working on the houses and watch these green numbers below the portraits of our uh, people here while I'm speeding up the game a little bit. So the first house is being finished right there. And here you can see it goes up. It's a development. There's always, you know, is following a curve if the uh, happiness out of some reason because this is the happiness reaches like five points higher it'll not jump immediately five points higher it'll go bit by bit over the course of the time to that level very important because it works the reverse way around too so we see here how much time we got for the remaining time of this season just as a side note and we can now wait until these houses are complete. While that's happening, I want to explain a couple of other things. Down here, the blue bar is our reputation bar. If that fills up completely, we win the game. Over here is the queen's impatience, which grows every minute, and if that fills to completely, we lose the game. Over here, we can draft new blueprints for buildings, and up here, we have a couple of other things that we're going to go over now. So, first up, buildings in this game are randomly drafted for every colony except for a few basic blueprints. So as you see here, basic collection camps, we have a collection of these always with us. We also can always build farm fields, we always can build shelters, and a couple of buildings that allow us to procure basic materials. That's all given, but uh, apart from the other infrastructure buildings that we got here and the decorations, all of the buildings need to be drafted for each and every new game uniquely. And that is what we get down here. So here we get to select now what kind of building we want to pick up next. This is probably one of the more complicated, I already wanted to say most complicated because it actually is. So first up, there is no time pressure in picking these blueprints. If you don't know what you want to pick, you don't need to pick. The magnifying glass allows you to take a look into the building and check out what they can produce. The weaver produces fabric, and here you can see out of what materials the fabric can be produced. We already noticed that we got some plant fiber in our possession, namely from cutting trees, and that means we could produce definitely fabric here. We got training gear and trade goods as well, which are more sophisticated things, and for starters, you'll be looking for two things first and foremostly, building materials and food. These are the most important things when you're starting out. Fabric is a building material, one of the three main building materials. Fabric, planks, and bricks. Planks are being produced out of wood, obviously, and bricks are the processed version of stone or clay. These three things are the pillars every colony will be built upon. So in this scenario, the weaver would be the top notch pick as the clothier provides no basic materials and no food. And the provisioner also produces no food directly, 
flour needs to get processed into food before we can do anything with it. So since we don't need to pick up anything, we're just going to leave it like that. And maybe we will find out when we open one of those glades something what we want to pick here. Up here we now see the cornerstones. Cornerstones are passive traits that you pick up also uniquely for each run. They influence your gameplay massively and they basically nudge you towards a certain strategy. Good example here, Fungal Guide. We will produce more mushrooms the more often we produce mushrooms. That is what it means in a nutshell. Every 25 cycles of mushroom production, there will be one more each time we harvest mushrooms. Since we don't have a uh, certain chance of finding mushrooms here anywhere, this is probably not the smartest choice. Other biomes have other be benefits, so this can be really, really good. It could be also really good if we happen to find some mushroom patches over here on the plate, whatever. It's always depending on your situation. Here, the cornerstones also don't have time pressure behind them, but you should not wait with them too long because they have passive effects and most of them are good. So here, Lost in the Wilds, every time we discover a new glade, we gain one villager. It's not the best, it's not the worst either. You normally don't want to have your population grow uncontrollably but one person ain't much and it'll help out our early game because in the early game you want lots of people quickly and later you want to stall your population growth but i'm getting ahead of myself this is not that important over here we have the orders orders are quests that you can fulfill to gain reputation points and other rewards. Once we open up one of these packs, the game tells us to choose between one of two objectives. So here we need to cut through, discover two glades, and in return, we will gain higher production on stone and clay, and we will gain six uh, items tools. All right, over here, we need to have two woodcutter camps and we need to deliver dirty wood and we'd be receiving resin parts which are used for all resource gathering buildings and many other infrastructure things you cannot produce them by yourself by the way or it's very difficult to produce them yourself i should rather say and villagers so we have now to decide which one we want to take the game is always giving you different rewards but the most safe bet if you are new to the game is to roll with the re uh, objective that you feel like you can fulfill it's always the most important that you feel able to fulfill that thing in our scenario here we can definitely go with both so i'm going to personally pick up the woodcutters because like i said early game extra villagers are really good although the extra production on stone and clay is also really nice tell you what we're going to go for that direction because i realized that this will help us out a lot over the long run so you see here short-term uh, rewards long-term rewards it's often a thing in this game and this goes on like this now for every pack Mind you that you don't have any time pressure to decide what what you pick here, but you cannot open another pack before you have decided on one of these quests. So we can't check out what's in the other pack before we decide here. Not happening. You see here timers for these quests to unlock. So the longer we play, the more orders we get. And the last thing to note is every time we fulfill one of these orders, we gain one point of reputation and we always lower the impatience in equal amounts as we gain reputation. So every point of reputation lowers the impatience by one point. This is the way how we survive against the impatience bar. So we either have to produce building materials or we have to sell things. Here I'm going to go for the building material packs as I find it pretty a pretty good opportunity to explain to you the building material packs. And here we have the last thing. Here we have a quest to keep the beavers resolve up above a certain level versus a couple of uh, camps that we need anyways. I'm going to go for this one because it's again a nice opportunity to give you a baseline tutorial about resolve. Okay. We have now more quests. 
And what's left to do now is to complete our baseline setup for our colony. What every colony needs besides these uh, encampments, let me slow down the game a bit, is one makeshift post to produce packs of various uh, sorts and a crude workstation which allows us to produce building materials. These buildings are not mobile. Unlike the uh, woodcutter camp where you can just move that thing for free, these buildings are not movable. So in the industry menu, we pick up the crude workstation and we place it down. This building can provide the building materials that I've been talking about previously. And with that, there's only one more thing that we are going to do. If you check out your hearth down here, it has here a list of upgrade requirements. It shows us now that we have housed the necessary amount of population. The first thing is the amount of people that require housing. And now we need to put up four pieces of decoration. So we're going to do that somewhere like there. And once this is completed, we will gain a upgrade to our hearth that will increase the global result by two. This is global happiness. And since one of our quests is to keep the happiness on 18, we're uh, almost there with that little thing. After that, it is time that we start gathering resources. We got a patch of dewberry bushes and a patch of clay deposits here. So clay obviously is our building material, but as you see here, there is always a chance to either find some copper ore or some roots along the side, which are food and other industry items. And with the dewberry bushes, there's a chance to get a second dewberry bush, a uh, second berry. With the trees, we have a variety of items that we can get there. And this is very important with the game. It loves to give you lots of site products, lots of other alternatives. If you check out here at the crude workstation, bricks can be made out of two different materials. All things can be substituted like crazy in Against the Storm. And it takes a while to get accustomed to that. And this extreme diversity of things is also the reason why the game feels so darn overwhelming at first. So the last thing that we do here is we set up a small herbalist's camp for this place orienting it uh, into this direction so our collectors have a short uh, way but also the people that carry it afterwards to the warehouse have a short way. So the decorations are finished and you see here happiness goes down another time. Uh, up, sorry. <laughs> Silly brain. And over here the clay uh, deposit is being harvested by the stonecutters camp and we do the same thing here. All harvesting camps are mobile camps. So the herbalist's camp and the stonecutter's camp can be moved around for free, just like the woodcutter's camp. So you don't need to worry about these, their, their placement particularly, it's just like that. And if you press left shift while hovering over anything, you can copy it directly because there's one thing that we definitely should do and that is a path leading to our hearth so people have a shorter way when they want to take a break. I leave this uh, center area here open um, on purpose as we will do other things with that in time. Now, I think this is a good point to leave episode one where it is. We have now an idea about how to collect wood. This happens via the woodcutters camps. If we put workers into the uh, gathering camps, they'll start gathering these materials. We know that housing ha plays a, in, uh, a, diff a important role. We know that resolve goes up. And by the way, if resolve goes down, people will leave the city. So keep it up. It's a very important stat. And we know how reputation works, drafting in basics. I'm going to go into that in the next episode, of course, and the order system. I think that's a lot to stomach. You can easily go for yourself, explore from there on with that kind of knowledge. In the next episode, we're going to crack open a danger clade, face our first storms, draft a couple of things and get this colony going. 
Thank you for watching you all. I really appreciate you ha having you around. Leave me a comment down below. Consider a thumbs up if you enjoyed. And as usual, there is a description box link thing down there leading to the playlist for that, to my Discord where I have a lot of cool gamers hanging out there if you like that like games like these as well. And there's also my Twitch where I stream every Sunday evening in the Middle European time zone. There's also a link to Patreon, Paypal, or Buy Me A Coffee, and I'd be really delighted if you'd gave them a look. A big, big thanks to all the supporters of the channel at this point. And also, I have made YouTube membership available. This is giving you early access to the videos before I release them. Whenever something is scheduled for release, my channel members can preview that early on. There's never going to be any paywalled content, so don't worry about the channel membership thing in that aspect. I strongly believe in free-for-all available content. I just want to say a th give a thanks back to the people that support the channel this way. Last but not least, thank you for watching this video and hanging out on this video even after my ads for myself and whatnot. Appreciate it. I hope you had a good time and see you all in the next video when we're going to go deeper. I'm going to explain a couple of hotkeys here too and I hope you have a good time until then. Bye-bye.